Dr. Steve Hayes, everybody. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to get to talk with this guy. He is a personal hero. It's the second time, actually, that we've gotten to speak. I had him on my podcast once last year, and that was like, I don't know, a highlight of my entire year because Dr. Steve Hayes has been such a tremendous impact academically, philosophically, um, as a clinician. So much of my style, so much of my theoretical orientation, so much of the way that I build metaphors, the way that I explain things, um, the viral videos that I have on TikTok or on Instagram, so much of that is undergirded by the theory and the influence of well, Steve Hayes and all of his co-founders and associates and, and the people who build ACT, the people behind, well, contextual behavior science, just as a field. I, I just am so enthusiastic to get to share this with you because it's been such a deep impact on me. So um, we talk about panic disorder today. Uh, you know, panic is something that I've really been looking at with fresh eyes. Um, if you've been following my work, you know, in the past year, I've been taking a lot of time to learn something called internal family systems, which is a trauma therapy. And I've been familiarizing myself with the neuroscience of trauma response. And panic is an area that I'm continuing to learn more and more about. And um, even looking at some of the research of guys like Pangsept and understanding the connection between like grief and panic. Something you might not know about Steve Hayes is that well, he would call that he's recovering from panic disorder. He struggles with panic attacks, and it's uh, something deeply personal for him. And ACT is one of probably the most prevalent, the most widely used therapeutic modalities for treating panic disorder. And so, I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone with more expertise on panic than Dr. Steve Hayes. And so why not ask the master himself and, and kind of hear his point of view? I loved this conversation. I hope you love this conversation. If you'd like to familiarize yourself with Dr. Steve Hayes's work after watching this video, check out his book, A Liberated Mind. It's a great general public read. You don't have to have a master's degree to understand it. It's not like a bunch of heady theory. It's really just ground level, a great, um, I don't know, contextualization of so many of his ideas just for the general reader. Um, super insightful book even for me. Having read all the textbooks, he just puts it in really powerful ways. And so uh, I would start there. Dr. Steve Hayes is fantastic. I'm excited to share this interview with you. I want to talk a little bit about the sponsor first before we dive into the interview. We had Element jump in as a sponsor for this video. I'm so excited about that because I pursued Element. Like I reached out to Element and asked if they would be a sponsor because I drink their product every day anyway. <laughs> so it's like easy to talk about. I really believe in it. Um, I was listening to Dr. Um, Andrew Huberman, who's a neurobiologist at Stanford. He's a professor there. And, and he was talking about his morning routine and the, the importance of hydration, and specifically that you would be better off if you drank a tall glass of water with some electrolytes in it um, first thing when you wake up in the morning instead of just running straight for your coffee, that you'd actually feel more alert, that you'd actually feel, hello? Oh, this is my cat, everybody. This is my cat, Pepper. She does not drink Element because she's a cat. So yeah, he was saying that you would actually feel more alert and more awake if you just drank water with electrolytes in the morning first instead of waiting for your coffee and actually to delay your coffee for like an hour, 90 minutes before or after waking up. And I thought that was super strange. I'd never heard that before. And, and he was talking about how hydration isn't just drinking a bunch of water, but having the right balance of fluids in your body, having the right minerals in your body between potassium and sodium and magnesium. And then he recommended Element and... I thought that was cool, so I went and I purchased some and I tried it out and they give you like this sample pack when you sign up and, you know, through a link and eat all these, you know, different flavors. I really enjoyed it. I like watermelon. That's probably my favorite flavor. Um, I also like raspberry. Where's raspberry? Anyway, so they were really gracious to give an offer for anyone who wanted to try it if you signed up and got an order of Element. Then you get a free sample pack, kind of like this, with a bunch of different flavors so you can try them all out. And if you hate it, you don't like it, they'll refund your whole order. You can send it back if you don't want it. That's totally cool. I love it. I think you will too. Check it out. Link is in the description under this video. But without further ado, let's get to Steve Hayes. Everybody, so excited to show you this interview. Steve Hayes, I'm so thankful to have you back. This is just great. Happy to talk to you. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I'm curious. The thing front of mind for me this week was panic and wanting to understand panic better. And I've, uh, I've been reading your work for several years on anxiety and panic and know that this is something that's actually pretty closely tied to your own story. You're, there are a few people alive that are more of an expert on panic, perhaps, <laughs> than you, both clinically and, uh, and maybe with some of your own personal journey. So you open to talking about that? Sure. Sure. Let's yeah. dive into uh, hell on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, why did you get interested in studying panic? Well, uh, that was kind of visited upon me by the fact that I developed a panic disorder. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting and fascinating phenomenon. And uh, for people who've never sort of uh, 
explored that territory, uh, it's one of those ones where when you see it, you can't unsee it, and you are now permanently different because most folks go around through life thinking that, you know, you're not going to get so emotionally overwhelmed suddenly in a situation that you can't talk, you can't think, you can't function, you will it could happen anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. It can ha come from zero to 60 in 30 seconds or less. So just imagine people who are listening, if, if you're driving or you're having a meal at home or you're on a podcast, uh, what would the world look like if you knew, and you could never unlearn this because once it's happened, it's in your memory forever, that within 60 seconds, you couldn't function. That's an interesting challenge. And it really opens the doors to, to some important areas of growth or insights or whatever. And it, it's been a blessing for me. I mean, my three year descent into hell, I wouldn't have called it a blessing. And the, you know, the many, many, many years that I've uh, worked on it, I think my last panic attack was 20 years ago or something, but it was a good 15, 20 years into the work that I'm doing now. And I've learned never to say never. So I'm in here right now, knowing 100% that in the next 60 seconds, I can get to the point where I can't function. That's possible. Yeah, there's the double fear of the actual terror of going through it. And then there's the terror that it could happen again at any moment and you're just vulnerable. Yeah, and those two things are fit together because in the initial panic attacks can come for all kinds of reasons. But even in that course, in that... In that 60 seconds or two minutes or five minutes or whatever it took to sort of first have the uh, tornado happen in your head, this kind of mental tornado, you did things. And when you unpack it, you realize, and you slow it down, you realize, okay, it wasn't just done to me. No, I mm. did some things. And those things turns out to be relevant to everybody, yeah. whether you got panic yeah. or not. Well, did you know that you were having a panic attack the first time it happened to you? What was that discovery oh, yeah. process like? Oh, yeah. yeah. My first panic attack was uh, in a department meeting, where, as I say, there's a TEDx talk where I walk, walk through this. Uh, I was watching full professors fight in a way that only wild animals and full professors are capable of. <laughs> and, uh, I was a non-tenured assistant professor, and they're just ripping each other up one side, down the other. I mean, everything mm -hmm. other than physical violence, but I mean, the actual, even if the words didn't sound like that, what they were, I mean, anybody who knew the culture and knew what was going on knew that this was uh, all out war that you were watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I raised my hand and I, I just wanted to ask them to stop, you know, that this is not mm -hmm. gonna produce a healthy department. And part of me is thinking like, geez, this is a department of psychology, come on. Don't you have any sense of shame <laughs> doing to each other? What is this? I mean, yeah. out of the blue, here comes, oh, I'm really feeling anxious. I wonder if I can actually speak here. You know, if they call on me and then 20 seconds later, my heart's going 180 beats a minute. I feel like I'm going to pass out. And then they finally do call on me. And I open my mouth and absolutely no sound came out. It was impossible to get sound out. They're like gasping for breath. And it went on like an eternity. I'm sure from the outside that it was 30 seconds or something. But from the inside, it was an eternity where I'm just kind of there mm. like some sort of goldfish out of water with my mouth going, Mom, but no sounds coming out. Yeah, yeah. And I'm an untenured assistant professor humiliating myself in front of a room full of, uh, of colleagues. Mm -hmm. And finally, they just went on. They never... So what's going on with you or is something wrong? No. They just kept talking. They just, just moved waited. along. We, and then they started fighting again. Huh. And finally the end meeting, and I was way away from the door. I was as far away as you could get. So I'm there now with wave after wave after wave for like half an hour. And finally the meeting ends and I kind of slink out of the meeting, you know, like almost clinging to the side of the wall, trying to hold myself up. And uh, a three-year journey into a place where eventually you know there was, an, there was very very few things that i could do i couldn't take a phone call couldn't take a trip i didn't want to get in the car I didn't want to get in an elevator i didn't want to give a class if i did give a class uh, you know my uh, i would sometimes uh, uh, be unable to even speak 
give a lecture i'd try to show films but then my hands would shake so bad i could hardly get the films in sprockets it's this old, old it was actually film in mm. sprockets people probably don't even know what that means anymore, <laughs> but there used to be these physical things called films and they were unreal so those sprockets <laughs> and then you had like this thing called a projector and then you know, anyway, no idea what you're talking about you don't know yeah, i yeah. know it's <laughs> It's another era, uh, but uh, and it, so it gradually just started taking away my life, just bite after yeah. bite after bite. But I presenting it as if it's passive. Take it away. No, it's not. Isn't that? I was feeding a tiger. It's like a tiger in the corner of the room. Like here's a chunk of meat. Here's a chunk of meat. I won't go to that meeting. I won't accept that invitation to give that talk. I won't, you know, take that trip. I won't travel. I I won't leave the house. I won't, you know, like chunk after chunk after chunk, and eventually. You know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night in full-blown panic attacks, you know, unable to breathe. So it would even take away my sleep. Like there was no place that was safe. Because everywhere you go, there you are. And what I was running from was inside me. Wow. That's kind of weird, isn't it? If you haven't yeah. been in that space, you can't even imagine it. You cannot imagine it. But it turns out it's really close. I mean, it's close to things that happen to all of us, the processes that feed it everybody knows about and when you un learn how to unpack it those processes are relevant to almost everybody and i can say that with certainty because now 41 years later um you know we've done the thousand randomized trials and the meta analyses and all that and what happened in my journey what i learned in that is relevant to everybody who's listening i'm sorry if it sounds arrogant but it, i know is not as a statistical fact, as mm -hmm. a scientific fact that it is. Well, I I sense that immediately because I, especially right out of school, I spent a lot of time reading your work in relational frame theory. And yeah. and there's the function of behavior was something that really fascinated me, that you essentially could overlay the same pattern of behavior in different contexts. And there's similar results, similar relationships between symbols. And so, for example, I noticed when I started doing couples work that people would avoid conflict with their partner in a lot of the same ways as what you're describing and avoiding things that could trigger a panic attack. And it's like, I can't talk to him about this because if you talk to him about this, he'll get mad. And if he gets mad, then he'll start drinking. And so like, and like you're saying, the tiger that comes and takes a bite out of every tiny little thing, it's like, okay, you start segmenting off this whole domain of your relationship, this whole domain of your experience, this whole domain of your interests, because you're worried it's going to frustrate them or they're going to reject you or they're going to, you're going to try to like make a bid for their interest and they're going to roll their eyes and, and look at you and just in disgust. And so it starts to feel more and more cramped and more and more small. And like you said, there you are just laying in your bed and you realize it's still in you. It's like, there's nothing left to avoid in the relationship. And then it starts to kind of just crumble um that that yeah. pattern seems to overlay well that part that piece you're talking about of avoiding your own emotions and experiences uh is probably the single most toxic thing that human beings can do not in every situation first responders so forth need to learn we mm -hmm. didn't know this right. when we started this journey but it's turned out to be true when they're actually in the ambulance and they're going to arrive and people will be on the street and some of them will die and some won't and you have to triage and you're looking at horrific scenes that will, you know, are like nightmares out of your dreams of, you know, people who are literally bodily bodies are spread across the street and so forth. This is not the time to cry. This is not the time to feel. This is a time to make hard decisions and do your best medically to save those that you can. Yeah. And so there are special circumstances and we put the harsh ones of war and things like that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. War. It's not always and it's not everywhere. But even that person, if they go home and then the memories have no place to go. Mm. Well, this is why you see and people who have jobs like that, alcoholism and drug problems, you see spousal violence, you see what happens when you run from emotions everywhere. So you better learn how even if you're in these difficult situations where sometimes you just can't, you can't afford it in this moment. Mm -hmm. Still need to learn how to create a space where you get to feel, remember, think, sense what you feel, remember, think, and sense. Because there's no delete button in your nervous system, mm -hmm. no healthy subtract function in this little computer called your brain uh, other than brain injury, and that's not something to pray for. So 
uh, you better learn how to carry it because otherwise it's going to simply dictate to you where you have to go. It's going to demand those chunks of meat and the meat you're throwing at it are chunks of your life and your freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were deep in the hell of panic disorder, noticing that it's taking bigger chunks out of your life, as you're laying in bed, realizing there's nowhere else that I can avoid. There's nothing else that I can just try to not come in contact with. It's in me. What was the journey from that point? What did you do? Well, you're running down now about a three year long string. Some people make it even longer, but it, it was really common. You get a whole bunch of folks together at panic disorder and you, they tell their stories and it's the same story. You basically <laughs> try to compromise with the beast. You know, you basically try to make a deal. Yeah, make bargains. Make yeah. bargains. Yeah. I won't do this. I won't do this. I won't do this. But of course, this is in you and your mind knows the trick. I mean, I just don't want to think about it. No, because now you're thinking about it, not thinking about it, which means you're thinking about it. It's not <laughs> logical, but it's psychological. That's how the mind works. Mm. You know, if I were to say to you something like, uh, uh, it's opposite day, say what comes to mind. Good. Bad. Yeah, of course. Black. White. Relaxed. Tense. Anxious. Yeah, exactly. So now you let's say you're going to try to just think about being relaxed. You got your relaxation tapes. You know how to do them. You have got images of being lying by the beach. You got to, well, and why are you doing this? So that you don't think about that. What? That thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want that because I don't know where that leads. If I think about that. My heart's going to start jumping. If my heart starts jumping, I'm going to focus on it. If I focus on it, it's going to jump even more. If I focus on it, you know. This is the. It's all connected. It's all connected. So you get in a situation, let's say, and you notice, hey, I'm feeling pretty good. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> you just plug yourself <laughs> into the wall socket. Yeah. So, like, there's no mm -hmm. place to go that's safe because all roads lead to Rome. Because the way the mind works, any relation is a relation. So, a mm -hmm. relation of different, opposite is not. Any relation is a relation. So, how are you going to? keep from going somewhere where anything that you think can be related to that place you don't want to go. Yeah. Literally any thought, give me a thought and I can tell you how it leads to panic. Relax mm -hmm. can lead to panic. I used to have panic attacks if I heard the relax word relaxation. Mm. Well, the answer is there is there isn't any place you can go. You know, this is why suicides happen inside panic disorder because people literally see no way out. And so you asked the question of how, what did it take? For me, it took running out that string until I had no way out. And I described this in the TEDx talk of sitting on a brown and gold shag carpet, or maybe it was green. Anyway, sitting on a shag carpet at 2.30 in the morning, thinking I'm having a panic attack and I need, and excuse me, a heart attack and I need to call the ambulance. And then realizing in kind of a fugue state with an out-of-body experience, kind of almost a, you'd say a spiritual experience, but not in the sweet flowery way that you'd think of, mm. but that, no, I wasn't having a heart attack. That's just another form of panic attack. It's just a weirder one that includes pain, shooting pains down your arm and pain, you know, a weight on your chest and all those symptoms of a heart attack that you're manufacturing because you can do it. And, um, and then realizing, okay, what that means is I can't even go to sleep. I can't trust my own body. And yeah, I know I can't give lectures. I can't get in front of people. I can't, blah, 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 blah. well, where can I go? And the answer is nowhere, mm -hmm. nowhere. And I don't know how long I sat in that state, but I, I saw in the TEDx talk of, I know when I sort of had this transformational spiritual kind of awakening, when I stood up, the tracks of tears on my face were dried and burned. So I, if you ever had that happen where you cried a lot and then the, and then you just stayed there dry. Long enough that they dry and then they have like a burning sensation of, mm. I don't know, from the salt or something. I don't know why that's like that. But I guess that's probably half an hour or 45 minutes of sitting inside the nothing of there is no way out and then catching the voice that was, had been dominating me in my head. There was a voice in there that was telling me what to do. And I don't mean a hallucination. I just mean my thoughts were telling me to, to do these logical, reasonable, sensible, pathological things of running, fighting, and hiding. And somewhere in there, I said, no, 
the word there were actually words that I said out loud, which I repeat there, which is I say to the voice within, I don't know who you are, but apparently you can make me hurt and you can make me suffer. But I'll tell you one thing you can't do. And here I'm actually pounding my chest. You can't make me turn from my own experience. You can't do it. And then my life does a 180, you know. I don't mean it does a 180 like flowers open up and then the panic attacks stop. No, yeah. it's like it was a different direction. I am not going to run from me. And I stood up literally inside a sworn oath. I am not going to run from me. And that was a completely different world, you know, from where I was sitting cross legged trying to deal with whether I should call the ambulance. Because that was that was the only strategy you had was avoidance. Just get away, get away, get away. And then there was this moment of like, I'm done running. Yeah, get away, rationalize, explain, compromise, throw the bits of meat to the tiger. All the 101 ways that you get away, you know, make a deal, manage. And that string had run out. And what I hit, you could say, was the moment where I realized the task is not to get out. The task is to get in. Hmm. And that you could actually... Now, why did that come to me? I, you know, I think some of it has to do with psychology training. It has to do with all those old hippy dippy things. It has to do with psychedelics and my history with that. It has to do with the human potential movement. It has to do with all the stuff I was doing in the sixties and seventies. You know, uh, but it also has to do just with well, actually, I, I realized it has to do with things that went all the way back when I was a little kid. I told the story of yeah. when I was a really little kid of being tortured by uh, dinosaurs and my dreams no i don't know this story i haven't heard you uh, okay well two big repeated monsters uh, uh, nightmares i had as a kid was one one gigantic robot monster with a huge eye that would chase me another was dinosaurs well the dinosaur ones i would dream that they would come and they would they would try to find me in the house and mm -hmm. and you know if you looked at a window there'd be like a gigantic you know tyrannosaurus rex eye looking in there <laughs> you know and then you'd go to another room in the dream. And sooner or later, they'd find that one, you know. And finally, you just can't stand it anymore. And you, you run outside the house and you run away. And But then you get into one of these running dreams. I'm sure mm. you must have had running dreams where no matter how hard you run, it's not fast enough. And you're being chased by the demons or whatever. I was being chased by dinosaurs. And I'd turn this way and fast. I'd do all the things of fancy footwork and so forth and it's getting closer and closer and eventually it would catch up with me and eat me and then i'd wake up well somewhere in this repeated nightmares as a little kid i have a lucid form of that dream where i'm aware that i'm dreaming but i'm still running like hell to get away from the dinosaur and i remember when it catches me, I'm going to wake up and I kind of would rather wake up than doing this dream. Hmm. I stopped, dead stop, turned and ran right at the Tyrannosaurus Rex and leaped in its mouth and woke up. And then I did it the next night. Yeah. And then the next night. And then the dinosaurs stopped coming to play. They didn't like this game. <laughs> They liked the one where they got to chase me down and eat me. If I ran towards them and jumped in their mouth, they didn't like that. That was no fun. And the dreams. What a oh. wonderful intuition of a young kid. Yeah, isn't it kind of an odd? I bet you people listening to me have had things like that, you know, where you mm -hmm. you just hit on the kind of illogical but kind of logical solution. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't need a way out, you need a way in. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it comes back to mind because I think this transformational moment, my night on the carpet, as I say, had that quality of I'm not going to run from me and realizing, you know, you, you can't make me run from my own experience. What that is, is a commitment to move in instead of out. I'm going to move into the painful experience and just see what's there. I'm going to jump into the mouth of the dinosaur. Eat me if you can. I ain't running. So what was that like when you jumped in? Well, in the initial night, um, it was transformational. When I stood up, I knew my life was different. I mean, I, I remember walking over. It was by now probably 3 or 3.30 in the morning. I know it started somewhere around 2 or 2.30 because I glanced at the clock. 
as my hand was reaching out for the phone and then coming back and reaching out for the phone and coming back when I'm mm. trying to decide if I'm going to call for the ambulance. And I remember looking out on a, a parking lot that was behind this apartment, which turns out was an apartment that my girlfriend had at the time, but she wasn't there and I don't know why. And I went on a search to try to find this place. Like, did I make it up when I actually wrote a liberated mind? And I <laughs> letters to every girlfriend, every past friend trying to figure out and I finally found it I go drove the map and said yeah that's my house that's exactly my house and my former girlfriend which just brought tears to my eyes because you know 30 years later did I make it up you know when it was this real it was so otherworldly but anyway what I walked to the back window and I looked out over the parking lot and it would be kind of like if suddenly tonight there was some incredible sunset that opened up and you sort of saw the sky in a way that you'd never seen it before mm. or it just lit up in a way that that dark parking lot looked transformationally different. I, I can't even tell you what it was. It wasn't a visual difference. It was just like... You perceived it in a different way. Yeah, and if I had to put it into words, it was something like, I belong here, you know, something like that. It's okay to be me, and I belong here. Because inside panic, and people listening to me, I bet you inside your addiction struggle, your depression struggle, whatever the thing is, or your abuse history, or your trauma history or something, there's this sense almost like you're an alien, like you don't belong, like like this life is not the legitimate valid life. This is some other life. This is the tortured life, the suffering life, the other life, the weirdo life, the, you know, you're the exception, you're different. You know, inside that looking out on a dark parking lot was I belong here and my experience is not my enemy. And it's not like those words came into my head. I'm just trying to characterize yeah, what a, this what a overwhelming emotion. Like. This, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. Well, I wonder what that looks like. It's a different context, so profoundly. Yeah, that is something as ordinary as a dark parking lot really looked different. Well, I wonder what some of those steps looked like practically, and what you went on to, I don't know, create for people to be able to arrive at a similar place. What moving in instead of trying to get out. Is is that some sort of like just giving up to the sensations that are happening? Is I don't know. Open that up for me a little bit more. What does that look like practically? Yeah, and I ask those questions really, really quickly because I'm still functioning as a psychotherapist. And oddly, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> guess who's coming to see me? I mean, I'm mostly people with uh, panic and anxiety disorder. And a lot of what's inside the early work, I mean, I remember these clients so well. Uh, a lot of these metaphors, a lot of these exercises were things my clients made up. <laughs> because when I tried to convey, and it was initially hard, I didn't know how to bring this into people's lives, but I knew it was important. And I had to figure out a way. They gave me the way because as, as I began to move in and open the space up, they started moving in ways that were really un atypical. It was the kind of thing you would occasionally see in traditional behavior therapy or cognitive behavior therapy, but it it now happened with a regularity and with a uh, speed to it. There was like transformational things happening where people really pivoting, uh, doing a 180, you know? So, uh, but, but that started, that came just by things like, well, what does that feel like? Can we go into that? Tell me what you see. What do you notice? Notice who's noticing. Uh, you know, of catching this more wit. Because in, in the night on the carpet thing, I have this out of body experience where I'm looking back at myself. Hmm. Uh, you know, as if consciousness is something that can be moved around by time, place, and person, as if you can go to another side of the room and look back at yourself, which is now a classic act exercise. Yeah. Very yeah. easy to do. I use it a lot. You know, and as soon as you do it, I mean, uh, I'm not going to take the time here, but as soon as you do it, uh, you know, if somebody's struggling with something and if they have a sense of leaving their body and looking back at themselves and really spending some time to look at yourself and how do you feel about yourself and do you love yourself and and then going to the side of the room and doing the same thing and then going to a wiser future and doing the same thing. So you mess around with person as if you're two mm -hmm. persons, place here and there and time. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because this 
the I here nowness of awareness, this witnessing, noticing sense of self, is, I think, this more spiritual part of us from which it's possible to look at the hell of your own history without closing your eyes and to fly into place in which it's truly okay, not as a judgment, but the way we sometimes mean okay, not okay versus not okay, but okay when the like, Roger, check, got it, here, mm-hmm, yep. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something more like present. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we use yeah. okay that way. And mm -hmm. some of these cheesy things of books, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah, they're pointing to something that's really important of that, mm -hmm. the inherent okayness of consciousness itself. That was an aha moment for me reading just your work. I, I learned that one pretty early on. And that's been like um really like a pillar of my clinical practice with clients. And it's it's something that never ceases to surprise me. And, I, and I'm always learning new pieces when I bring that idea up. Because, for example, like maybe we're exploring a traumatic past and the self-criticism really starts to become pervasive. Maybe even it oscillates into self-hatred. And then a simple question like, I just want you to take a step back and I just want you to imagine for a moment like a part of you just walks into the room and sees you and I just sitting here. Um, read the body language of the woman sitting on the couch. What does she look like to you? Yeah. It it pulls you out of almost this tunnel visioned, you know, uh, I don't know, self torment in a lot of in a lot of yeah. spaces, and it can be the bedrock that for some people can really create some warmth and almost some compassion and it gets you in touch with the sadness that might be animating the self-criticism yeah, yeah, yeah. without me without me needing to like explain that to you without me needing to teach or be like listen you know what's really underneath your self-hatred is is a lot of sadness i don't i don't need to say that it'll it'll rise up in the room yeah. without any sort of without me needing to provoke it or suggest it just by simply shifting perspective. Another one that I'll use often is someone's being really self-critical towards themselves, really frustrated, like, oh, I'm just this piece of garbage. And I'm just like, I want you to imagine for a moment that maybe they have a younger sister, that your younger sister, who experienced some of the same things, let's say that they experienced it just like you did, and then they went through a lot of these circumstances. Let's say you switched places, and she was talking about herself that way. What would be your response? What's your reaction to hearing your sister say that about herself? And I'm not even suggesting that, isn't that so rude of you to say that about yourself? Like, would you say that about your sister? Nothing like that. Yeah. Just just a neutral question. And it's like a part of them immediately sobers up to the self-criticism. I don't need to argue with them. I don't need to yep. say, oh, that's that's a little unrealistic or that's that's you're, you're kind of like, you know, exaggerating there. It's like they actually have all that insight and intuition and wisdom already programmed in just with a subtle shift of perspective. It was... It was, uh, yeah, illuminating to be able to notice that shift of shifting your time, place, person, and the insight that can come. It happens so fast, and, you're in, you know, these ways that you're expressing are your way, and they're a little different than other clinicians, but they're tapping into the process of uh, person, place, and time. And as these features of perspective, which taps into this more witnessing, noticing, spiritual sense of self, which is begins even before human language, I believe, because we're such social primates taking perspective as part of our birthright, but is built out by language and these relations of I and you and here and there and now and then that you learn and then you show up around age three. And from that moment forward, that kind of consciousness is this dimensionless strand on which the beads of experience are placed. And it's why you can remember and story about and put together, but when you tap into the strand instead of the story, you find that there's a part of you that's quite open by nature, that is non-judgmental mm. by nature, Yeah, that will uh, allow you to risk and to yearn and to care and to do things that are hard uh, without fear dominating you by its nature and it's really really cool to be able to tap into it i think the mindfulness traditions do it wisdom traditions mm -hmm. do it. depth oriented psychotherapy therapy do it transformational experiences do it i mean if if you look at the transformational spiritual moments in people you know you used to believe and i was a maslow fan early on that this was something peak experiences and stuff that only happens to the, mm -hmm. the elite no, if you ask the question right, 90 some odd percent of the folks have spiritual experiences, 
defined by these unusual senses of unity across time, place, or person. Sometimes just by the looking in the eyes of the, a loved one or, uh, you know, however it shows up. Sometimes in their religious traditions and during prayer. And well, if you can bring that space in, which you just did with your questions, because you, you now know a little, you know, and this, some of this is the RFT stuff, some of this is the stuff that comes out of this. When you know that that's part of how the I hear and nowness awareness comes together, it's really easy to mobilize some of those resources just with questions like the ones you're asking. Mm. And people mm. instantly become wiser. And one of the things that means, and I, I, I say it to, you know, people, you have the knowledge within to move forward. Uh, what you need to do is sort of show up and tap into it. And let's see if we can sort of find that. I, I, I don't want to, I'm not saying like, you have it and you're not using it. I'm not meaning it as a form of criticism. I mean it as a uh, invitation to self-fidelity. Hmm. Uh with the Latin root of that, fidelity, the root is the same root as the word for faith. It's fides. And when you're mm. with that fade fides, that's called confidence. So <laughs> with confidence. fidelity means with fidelity. That's what confidence is. Wow. You usually think it's an emotion. No, no, it's not an emotion. That comes later. It's the mm. faithing that your experience is not your own enemy and that you can sort of walk inside that. Mm. So I, I think we, and I, another way to say this is we need to mobilize the spiritual part of us yeah. to help empower our life's moments so that we get to live the kind of life that's about what we want it to be about. We don't know what the features of it are going to be because a you know, car could drive through the window this instant and then the features are about how you're going to deal with an <laughs> injury or something. Yeah. That, yeah, but but what the storyline is, whether you're writing a tragedy or a hero's journey, that's up to you. I'm curious. I want to rewind just a little bit because we've embedded an assumption that might not be self-evident to some people. Yeah. That panic is in some way related to a past traumatic event or an emotion or an experience that you don't want to approach. That it's not just like a bodily sensation. I, I talk to people pretty frequently who are just like, oh, I just have panic disorder. It's a chemical imbalance in my brain. I need to take medication that stops it. Um, you know, that's just something about my body. And, and there's not always a connection to, there might be something deeper psychologically happening. What's your, what's your response to that, to that domain, that tension? Well, um... If you, if you look at just the data on uh, the effect of medications for panic, yeah, you can dampen down the frequency of panic attacks, but it doesn't necessarily dampen down the avoidance that goes with it, the life restrictions mm -hmm. that go with it. And so um, if it really is what you just said there, dude, how come you, know, you decided that you weren't going to be the one to seek the promotion? knowing full well that that challenge would be scary as hell, yeah? Or that you weren't the one who's going to, you know, ask that girl out or decide this relationship that's really not working. You need to face that and do something about it. Or when I take a broader view, no, I don't need to. It's not necessarily traumatic or whatever. It could be whatever it is. I mean, you get people come by this multiple ways. I'll give you an example, bad drug trips, illness, very common sources of panic disorder. Why? Well, all you really need is, you know, be knocked sideways by a, a COVID infection, let's say, and how awful that feels and weird it feels and all of that. And it'll give you moments where if you did the wrong things and made your own experience your enemy, you could absolutely have a bad illness-driven panic attack. And as I said before, once you have one you know that it exists. So, I mean, the idea that one out of five people have a mental health problem, oh, please, five out of five people are challenged mentally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we just get over that weird thing that it's them? Yeah. We're supposed yeah. to pity them? Is that really what destigmatizing looks like? That doesn't look like destigmatizing to me. Yeah. No, this is, and after these two years of COVID, does anybody actually believe it's them? Mm. I think we all kind of went. Oh my goodness, this might be me. It's all of us. Yeah. So, and the door that opened you up in the case of panic to making your own emotions your enemy, you could have come by very easily from a virus or a, somebody giving you, uh, uh, you know, ooh, ooh, we're going to have fun taking this uh, drug tonight and actually has strychnine in it. 
or whatever the thing is. Yeah. Right. So in cases like like that, or I've also known people who have a really bad marijuana trip and then yeah. they get panic after that. The the thing that you're zeroing in on is that there's a resistance to experience that underlies the panic. There's a resistance to whatever, maybe that drug, maybe that trip pushed you into a place that really freaked you out or that really overwhelmed you. And your response to that was that rigidity and that resistance. And it's in the tension of that rigidity and that resistance. Yeah. And I think without training, all of us have that within. So it isn't more like, oh, you're resistant beforehand. No, you may have become resistant in that very moment because you hit a place where you said no. What did you say no to? Your own experience. Okay, well, how did that work? Well, if you say no strongly enough and dramatically enough and with, you know, underlined with exclamation points, um, where does the no turn into the yes? And that's the process of sinking into. Now, not everybody does it. If you ask the questions properly, it turns out there's a lot of people who've had panic that never developed into a panic disorder. Just like there's a lot of people that had really initial uh, you know, stages of uh, OCD, let's say. That's so common that we even make kind of children's games out of it. You know, don't step on a crack, you'll break grandmother's back. And I mean... Where did that come from? Well, it came from a cognitive structure that is right on that edge. Yeah, that's fascinating. So there's there's experiences like panic that comes from a bad trip, but not everyone oscillates into a panic disorder. Exactly. And so the underlying psychology of the panic disorder, like you pointed out a few times, is you know that that state of hell exists and your determination to never reach that pit of hell again actually creates a whole system of psychological compulsions and, and behavioral systems to avoid and that avoidance yeah, is yeah. actually what pours yeah. gas on the and fire i'm mentioning uh, the ocd because it's another common example that almost yeah, everybody yeah. taps into if if you've ever been way up there and let's say the statue of liberty or something like that or on the edge of the grand canyon or something you notice that you rock mm-hmm. when you get too close to the railing you rock why do you rock because you're telling yourself not to lean over so much so that you don't fall, which activates the muscles that move you back. But then you're not fully in tune with that. It's just a natural thing to a thought saying, oh, you know, don't get too close, don't lean over. And so you rock back, but then you sense that you're going back. So, of course, you have to activate the other muscles and you're in the rock. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. some people think, oh, my God, I want to jump. I want to jump. Look, I'm, ro- I'm going to fall. I'm going to, uh, 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 you know, and yeah. you can walk right into you know, a real phobia of heights and of, yeah. uh, and you know, maybe I'm secretly suicidal and maybe that uh, mm. OC kind of thing. Yeah, same thing with those compulsions. Like I have a knife. I could just stab someone yeah. that I love. Like, why would I stab? I don't want to stab, but maybe I will though. And so then you start avoiding knives. It's the patterns of avoidance that underlie those fears. Exactly. My mom struggled with this uh, clinically and she'd wash her hands till it bled and so forth. And I, I only learned three years ago when a 23 and me let me know that my mother's mother's sister's son lived about 100 miles away. And I went and visited him oh. and learned why. I'll tell that story if you're interested, but it really changed my whole life because I understood my mother so well in my 70s. I finally figured this out. But hmm. what is inside that OCD thing of these thoughts that can't be allowed you know uh, i'll give you an example you're driving over a bridge it's a really really high bridge the railing's not very high it's a beautiful view off to the side you kind of want to look there because you want to control the car and then you have the thought i should just pull the wheel and, and i'd sail off into you know like how many people would have that thought 70 80 percent of the folks what would happen if- i have yeah you've had that right You want to develop panic, uh, OCD? Be really committed to never have that thought. Hmm. You just plugged yourself into a wall socket. You now have the self-amplifying energy of avoiding the thought, which evokes the thought, which leads to more avoidance and emotional reactions. And there you are. I mean, you can absolutely be on that journey. I've mentioned it because actually after the panic, it's still in the act world, but it took a, it didn't last very long. I actually developed this kind of obsessive uh, fear that I was going to harm my uh, my firstborn son. Hmm. It's like the knife thing. And I remember being in a Brazilian forest way up top on a big kind of tall 
uh, hotel that was in the forest, but it was very warm. And so there was no windows and we were having a meeting there and all the things were open. And my uh, son was uh, just crawling. And I had this really strong image of what it would be like to fling him like a Frisbee across the tops of the trees of the Brazilian forest. And it hitting me so hard, like I was grabbing the chair like my mm. white knuckle grabbing it chair so that I don't yeah. frisbee my my baby into the forest. Mm. Well, and this is after I'm doing the work on panic. It was like, boom. Yeah. It, and, you know, I catch it. It didn't really dig in and develop a whole thing, but I had to walk out what could have been a real full-blown OCD thing. Absolutely could have been. And it lasted around for a few weeks. I mean, it, it hit me so hard before I caught what I was doing mm. that it was like wow. tormenting me just uh, later on. And so our capacity cognitively mm. to create worlds that have never been, that are fearsome and frightening, and thereby actually create that world, which of yeah. course then confirms the story. Look, mm. look, I actually did want to jump off the, or I actually was going to do this horrible thing, or I actually had that panic attack to the point I could not make sound come out of my mouth. I could not. That's real. And people were I passed out on the freeway. That's real. Mm -hmm. People in a panic attack will pass out. Yeah. How are you going to drive? Well, you're going to do it by learning this thing that your mind doesn't give you an easy way to learn, which is to ride these emotional waves and respectfully decline your mind's invitation to go down into that part of the network that, yes, can actually remove your ability for your body to function. Your body can shut down. You know, all those things can happen. I had a client of mine who was a very successful panic disorder client. And he said, you know, when I came to see you, I thought, boy, it is just not safe for me to feel this and this and this and this. And he's walking through all the things he's experienced. This is a very successful client. If I can, a 30 second example that towards the end where he was doing self-composed graduation exercises, he took a, a Caribbean cruise. He'd never like, he almost left his house in like a decade. Mm -hmm. Took a Caribbean cruise, a storm comes up and he says, I'm I'm gonna do it. And he runs to the front. Don't I do not do this at home. Uh, I don't suggest <laughs> this, but it was brilliant. He went to the forward thing of this cruise ship, the, not a huge one that doesn't get affected by and a big storm's coming up. And he wraps his arms around the 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 you know the struts on the railing, like something out of uh, the movie The Titanic. And the storm passes through and he goes, <laughs> no, like, like you just screaming, the, you know, just like, courageous oh, yelp, you know, like I'm not running from anything, you know. Yeah. Well, but he's to finish the story, he said, I used to think that I had to run away, it was life threatening if I didn't, and now I know that deep in my bones that it's life threatening mm. if I do, or something more like life crushing, it wasn't threatening, life crushing if I do. So, what would it be like if you respectfully declined? Your mind's invitation to live inside a cage, to live inside a box, to say no to experience, to say no to relationships, to say no to opportunities, to live life small. What would happen? Not to drive yourself to be big and grand. That's that's just a, another version of the same sick thing. I'm talking about what would it be like if it was okay to be you? That might be interesting. Something that resonates in my own story is is not knowing that I actually could survive the terrible things I was trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. And there's this invitation that I, I give clients sometimes when there's the right rapport. It, sometimes it's not always appropriate to say it this direct, but I'm just like, I think, yeah, the pain is probably really terrifying. You're right. I think you could survive it. And I think you're strong. You have this strength. You have this wisdom. You have this capacity to hold this thing, and it feels like it'll swallow you up. It feels like if I give it just an inch, it will pull me down into this bottomless pit where I'm in that hell forever. That's the fear. If I let it have just an inch of ground, then I lose myself. Exactly. I lose everything that I care about, and then I'm gone. And, and so could you face that moment and open up in that with faith, that con fides, fidelity, self-fidelity place 
where it's okay to be used so thoroughly that you can even have that scary thought. And you don't have to go like, no, no, it's not a fight. You don't have to fight this thing. You know, you do the strength that comes from being your whole self and the peace of mind that comes from that, the confidence, even the emotion that generally, if you keep doing it for years, eventually comes, it shows up, but that's not the engine. That's the exhaust. The ex mm -hmm. engine is that leap of faith, that fides, faith move, that fidelity move. And then when you just decline the mind's invitation to turn yourself into a, a kind of a broken thing where parts have to be removed before what's left behind is okay, where it's like, no, all of me, all of my history, all of my memories, all of my moments belong. And I'm walking all of that in a new direction. That is a place in, in the physical world, you would say, how do you know that you're really working on yourself as a physical being? You'd say, well, how about I'm strong? I have endurance, I have flexibility. And I know how to enter into teams to work with my mates. If you're doing things in sport, you know those four things. Yeah. You know, you know you're going to work on your strength, endurance, flexibility, and teamwork. Okay, well, how would you apply that to yourself now? Well, it turns out the strength part is the fides part. It begins with, yes, I belong. Yes, mm. my own experiences are valid. The endurance mm. part comes from the vision. What is this even about? You know, the, the values, vision you're on. What are you trying to do in your life? If you see that I have the capacity to produce a life full of meaning and purpose, and I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm walking that journey of creating a loving world or a more just world or just being more of who I am or being able to hold a podcast, contribute to the mental health of others. I don't know what it is. But that'll keep you going at two in the morning when you got to prepare for the next guest or whatever it is. I don't know, mm -hmm. but that endurance piece. How about the flexibility piece? When you're open to all of it, you don't have to run from any of it. You know, you can sort of go into the pain, not in a harmful way, but in a way that allows you to ground the whole of that journey. And what about the teamwork part? Well, one part is that all of these voices, all of these memories belong together like one gigantic team. You're kind of like the mayor mm -hmm. of a big city. But the other thing is that you're the social primates and you get to actually create a world where, for example, you can talk about your emotions with people who love you. Yeah. You can share your values with somebody who wants to be on a journey with you. Yeah. You can pick your team. You can get as big a team as you want. You want to have a team of two or three, you could do that. You want to have a team of 20, you could do that. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty cool sports thing where like we played football. If you want 40 people on your team, you get to have 40. You just yeah. do the work to create the social world that fits that. I think the message that's inside this work that we're exploring is one that mental resilience is something that's not a one out of five. It's a five out of five. And it's not one hour a week. It's 24-7. Yeah. And don't treat that as another wagging finger. Treat that as every moment matters. And including those places where you're just relaxing or you're, you know, having a beer or you're, you're sitting in your chair or you're looking at your loved one. Yeah, and it includes those moments when you're preparing for something that's hard or remembering something that was difficult. And in there, you'll find wisdom. And the wisdom is going to come from these so-called bad moments. And thank God for panic disorder. I have no idea where I'd be without it. I know I would not be where I am now. And I really sometimes fear where it would be because I might have climbed into the clown suit of achievement period end of story in the, in the eyes of others. And I know that's a dark place. I know that's an empty place. Instead, I've been able to live my life in a place where I get to be about what's at the bottom of any email you get from me, which is love isn't the only thing. It's the everything. It's everything. Excuse me. Not one, love isn't everything. It's the only thing. I get to be about that. I do. And, yeah. uh, and I hope I've served the a few folks here with this hour we spent together. I'm confident you have. Thank you, Steve Hayes. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Love and life. Make sure to check out Dr. Steve Hayes' book, A Liberated Mind. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>